Guitar practice session 10, 11, 24. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where I practice whatever I think I need to be working on and then provide a recap so you get an idea of what you're getting into. This, of course, being that recap, hoping the practice sessions help me to generate a routine, verbalize what I'm trying to learn to get it in my mind better, possibly provide information for others doing a similar process, possibly also providing for feedback if anybody sees a better way to get the things I'm trying to learn in our head. So if you want to do a similar type of practice session, I'll try to provide these worksheets to you. I do think it's useful to try to at least act as though you're teaching the information to someone else because it forces you to basically verbalize that information. So don't worry about like plagiarism or anything like that. If you want to use the worksheet and make your own type of practice sessions or do whatever you want to do to uh, the worksheet, that would be fine. Noting the layout of the worksheet might be a little bit different than the structure of other guitar worksheets in that my goal here is try to get everything going the same way from the perspective of playing from behind the guitar. And therefore, if we were behind the guitar, we can imagine imprinting the guitar on the screen of Excel, having the result of the low or heavy E string on top, top to bottom, left to right, orientated in the same direction as you would be from the perspective of behind the guitar. I'm also going to flip my guitar around so it looks like I'm left-handed so that you can look at my fingering positions, try to tie them out to the worksheet that will be on the screen as easy as possible to get an idea, a feel of these shapes, and then also apply it to your own guitar in the same basic uh, direction. Our general objective right now, I'm really focused in on just trying to see these shapes in such a way that I can move them and memorize not so much the chord or the note names, but the relative positions. I'm trying to focus in on all the types of things that are relative to each other so that I can go from, from the principle of being able to shift everything, kind of like copying and pasting in Excel so that everything will be moving and I can identify where everything is, not by the name of the note, but the interval that we're talking about or the, the modes that we're going to be in. So as I do that, I'm going to keep on comparing everything to uh, the major scale. So we're going to be working on the Dorian mode, which I call mode number two. And we're going to keep on comparing these relative positions to the major scale because that's kind of like our point of reference, our basic like Rosetta Stone, for example. And so we'll work on basically where the modes live. Over here, we'll talk about the uh, intervals for the Dorian mode and uh, the relative positions. And then we'll get into this shape, which I call shape number five. You might also call it like a Mixolydian shape or something like that as well. And then uh, we'll talk about the shapes within it, breaking out each of these into either a, a, a house analogy or a barbell a hamburger analogy as we do have done in the past and then before we go into each of the intervals going from the bottom to the top I jump on over to the three note per string tab and we try to learn these in our three different ways although I was a little bit more distracted today in doing it that being I want to learn these scales by shape and then by interval and then by what you might call formula in that whole steps and half steps formula and so I'm, I'm trying to apply that here, but a little less rigorously than before. I'm looking at the shape up top and thinking of it from the key of C and see how the key of C basically, or the major scale, the Ionian, goes through basically a, a few different intervals before it actually repeats. The shape doesn't repeat until you go through like seven strings. So I, that's something I think is really interesting to note when we look at the three note per string shapes. And then we're going to focus down here on the D, which if I looked at the D shape starting from the top string would be equivalent to our shape number three if I was to break the guitar into three note strings. And I'm trying to focus in more on how we might use these three note string constructions in conjunction with the five note per string. So if I'm playing in what I would call position number three, the Dorian position, for example, I note that I have my three pillars shape right here, which gives me a, a pretty easy, convenient way to reach out to this B instead of this B. 
And if I can do that without switching my mind completely to go into these three note per string shape, but still think about myself as being in what I would call shape number three, or the Dorian shape, or the caged D shape, if you call it that, and then I can just add into my thought process that I could reach out to these three strings, that's useful, uh, a useful integration to start integrating the two ideas of the two different ways you can think of the, the scales. Then I also go down here to and think about that same idea in the Mixolydian mode, and that's because we are working on mode or shape number five, and even though we're looking at the D, Dorian within it, uh, this shape covers it, right? So I look at this shape a little bit and think about that same three pillars shape, which is really the distinguishing shape between the two, uh, the two ways of looking at the guitar and see where that lands in shape number five, which is right at the top. And just imagine, okay, anytime I'm playing this shape, which oftentimes we're playing, playing in mixolydian, which is kind of the bluesy shape, this reaching out to that last shape or to that last column over here gives us a whole different set of options. And again, if I can just integrate that idea into as I play in this shape, it gives me a, a, a whole nother set of options without basically having to switch my entire mind to, to looking at another shape. I can just kind of extend that, tack that on to what I know. I think that's a good way to kind of build up. So I'm going to be playing with that idea. So we go into that a little bit here. And then we go into the lean back shapes, similar concept. We're looking at the key of D and we, ex we look at the two note per string shape and notice how we can build that. And as we do that, we can think about two lean back chords, like a G, a G minor shape uh, chord and an E minor shape chord that are connected together gives us our scale D, E, F, G, A, B. And then I can also think about that same concept from any D. So if I went to this D, and leaned it back. I can compare this D to the E next to it, or I can compare it backwards to the C, and I can build these shapes from anywhere on the guitar, noting that I have to be up a little bit on the guitar because they're gonna be lean back shapes. So we go into that a bit, and then I go back to the key of C and we work backwards from intervals, going from this D back up, which I think is useful to do because this D is across the fault line. So when we start to try to memorize our interval shapes, then one thing that's difficult in doing that is, is to memorize the shapes when it's not across the fault line and then adjust them when they are across the fault line. The second thing people have problems with is identifying the shapes from the perspective of the bottom note, which is like usually the inverse of the shape. And so those are two things we can practice a lot by going up. As I do that, we also go into each of these intervals. I try to spend more time making chords to see how the intervals are useful uh, when we start to think about the different notes in each chord. In other words, if I look at, say, uh, the third, when I get to the third, I can look at the relationship of it to the first. But one of the reasons I want to know those relationships is so that I can build the intervals off of the third based on the mode that I'm in, which means I can make more complex chords that are still in the related key, in this case of Dorian. So that means I'm gonna make the one, three, five, I can build a chord off of the third, and then I can extend it, let's add the seven, let's add the nine, 11, and 13, noting the nine, 11, and 13 are equivalent to the two, four, and six. So, so, We'll start experimenting with that idea. I get a little tired at the end, so I might make some mistakes at the end as we do that. But that's what I want to kind of spend more of my time kind of applying these intervals that we've learned and the modes that we have learned to building chords on each of the notes within uh, within the scale. And as we do that, we'll, we'll use the, the knowledge of the mode that we're in to possibly add more complexity than just whether it has a major or minor third, adding the seven, the nine, the 11, and then thinking about how we can finger that in multiple different ways, possibly if like we're looking at this E, looking at it up top this way, up top this way, down this way, back this way, right? I can, which direction am I gonna be looking in order to build my, my chord? Most people look this way as a bar chord down going forward but that's not the only way you can build a chord, right? We can do the inverse and, and so on. And once we know the intervals, it'll be a lot easier for us to build 
a chord or look at a chord that we're looking at from different perspectives. And that's another thing that confused me a lot of times, because like if I look at like three or four notes, I want to be able to say, I used to want to be able to say at least, there's only one name for those four notes. This, this is this chord, that's what the chord is. But that's not really the most useful way to see it because I could be seeing it from different perspectives, right? Like if I look at this chord, I'm looking at, I might be building it from the key of E, even though that's the highest note in the chord from a pitch perspective, right? And so, so, so it might be useful for me to, to look at the intervals as they relate to this note. Or sometimes I might be wanting to look at the intervals as they relate to the B, if that's the main point of focus on whatever it is I'm, I'm working on. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? So there, I don't think there's like one name for any four set of notes that you have to call it this and you can't call it something else because it depends on the perspective you're looking at. Some people might argue with me about that. I don't know, but that's what I'm thinking right now. Continuing on with what I would call shape number five, looking at what I would call mode number two, that being the Dorian mode. We're gonna be going from the bottom of the scale back up to the top of the scale this time, remembering that we're using an absolute mode numbering system based on the major scale, otherwise known as the Ionian mode, the major scale acting as our point of reference from like a physics analogy standpoint as we float around the space and time of the modes we are using that as our point of reference so we can measure to it or in terms of languages like a rosetta stone we have the major scale in our mind we can compare everything else to it to get an idea of what's going on with everything else so just a quick look at the major scale or ionian mode up here we've got the relative positions one through seven and then we've got the mode names one through seven now if we're looking at the major scale most people start to memorize that i can build chords triad three note chords knowing if it's major or minor chord construction by having the one four five be major the two three six be minor and the seventh be locrian if i know that and then i change to a dorian mode notice the relative positions will change the notes will be the same ultimate notes but they'll be in a different order if i can then compare back to the major scale i can at least know whether i play a major or minor chord based on the numbering system of the major scale that's one useful component beyond that though if i know the numbering system of the modes that's going to tell me beyond just whether it has a major or minor third in the chord construction it tells me all the intervals so then we can build any complex chord we want within any of the of the chords or or intervals within the scale based on what whatever mode that scale should be built out of which will mean that that complex chord will still be in the key of uh, C Ionian or in our case the D Dorian so that's the project we're basically trying to keep in mind so that means that if I'm in Ionian Ionian would be the first mode the Dorian would be the second mode so I'm going to call the Dorian here still uh, mode number two even though we're in the Dorian mode it's the first relative position in the Dorian mode we're looking at D Dorian which is going to be the relative mode compared to the C major so it has all the same notes as uh, the C major but then I'm going to use an absolute numbering system that is based on the relative positions of the major scale so that the modes never change that absolute uh, numbering system. And that's where I'm gonna be applying the uppercase and lowercase Roman numerals, which help to indicate whether or not it's gonna be a major or minor uh, chord, which you also kind of know by just knowing that uh, the, 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 the one, four, five is major, the two, three, uh, and six is minor in relation to the major scale. So, so I, so I know that. And then, and so that's going to be that. And then we will look at uh, the intervals. Remembering with the intervals, what we basically want to learn are the major intervals. And then we want to learn the minor intervals, which are going to be the same as the majors, except all of the major components are going to be turned to minors, except the second here which is still a major second in the aeolian or minor mode and then the perfects remain the same so then when i compare something like the dorian 
then I would compare it to the minor mode, which is called the Aeolian mode, and there's only going to be one interval that is different. So notice we're still using the key of C, or the, or I'm sorry, the major as the Rosetta Stone. We're comparing the main minor to the major to get our main minor uh, mode, and then we compare all the other minor modes to the main minor mode, and the Dorian is one of the other minor modes. So we have the Aeolians, the main minor, and then the Dorian and the Phrygian. So if we do that and we go through these intervals, we can say, what intervals do we have? The Dorian has a perfect first. It has a major second, which is the same for both the, the major scale and the minor scale, the Aeolian and Ionian. It's got a minor third, the distinguishing factor being the minor third. And then it's got a perfect fifth, which is the same for the major and minor, a perfect, uh, I'm sorry, perfect fourth, a perfect fifth, and then it has the distinctive major six, which is unusual for a minor. So that's the one interval that is different. And then we have a minor seven. Now remember the numbering system that I'm using here is that people don't usually put a 10 note away minor seven. They just say it's the seventh, that represents the seventh relative position. And that's why we need to reorientate the relative num position for the numbering system. That's why, in other words, I can't just use the same major scale here and just play around the two. I could do that and I'd be playing in Dorian and I just call it the second position. But when I start to use the intervals this way, when I try to construct my, my intervals based on the root, these intervals are based on the idea that, that, we're, that this is gonna be the one relative position one because I'm in mode number two or the Dorian mode. So that's what this, this seven represents the seventh position in the scale relative to the first position, which in this case is a D and it's 10 notes away. So on a piano, you can see 10 notes away because it's linear, but on a guitar, we're usually playing multiple strings. So it's worthwhile for us to repeat, in my opinion, that it is seven notes away and actually count up what it means to be seven notes away so that we're not only use, learning the shape, although I do want to learn the shape and just saying, hey, I can see that that's a major seven. I want to prove to myself that the shape is correct without having to check a chord chart. And if I know it's a 10 note away, sorry, 10 note away minor seven, then I can prove it to myself by counting the intervals of 10. I don't need to say, oh, I got to look it up and see what the shape looks like because because the shape is something I want to learn, but I also want to be able to, to prove it to myself. What does it mean? It means there's 10 steps in there. So we'll practice that as we go uh, backwards through this shape and then uh, the shape, different shape names that we have here, uh, you might call this, I call it position number five. Why do I do that? Because this position number one is that for many people, including me, and that's a generic system, but it works. And then that means that there's only five shapes. So the one behind the one has to be five because it starts over one, two, three, four, five, and then back to one like a circle. So then we're on position five here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if I start on that one, notice I'm starting on this G, and the G, as you can see, is uh, the, the mixolydian. So you could call this a mixolydian position, because if I started on this top note in the position, I would be playing mixolydian. Now we're gonna be playing, of course, the Dorian in this position by starting on that note, the Dorian note. So I'm starting, I was still kind of experimenting with the name of trying to name each shape by the mode that it's in. So I could say this is one, two, three, four, five, the fifth note Dorian shape, meaning I can, if I would be cool if I can name the shape by each of the relative po mode positions. So I can say it's the fifth, it's the shape that has the fifth note in the shape is the Dorian. Not many people actually name it like that. I'm not sure that's gonna be completely useful. I think it is useful if you're talking about uh, the first two notes because we, we saw that some shapes like shape number two could either be the Locrian shape if you started on the first note or the major shape if you start on the second. Therefore, I would call that like a second note major shape because the second note is the one you need to start on in order for it to be the major key. Otherwise, you'd be, it'd be a, a Locrian if you played around the B of it. But 
that is that. Now, from a caged system, I can look at the relative major, which is going to be uh, the C here. So there's the C. And I can see if I built a lean forward shape, that would be my A shape. So that's going to be, uh, you could call this from a cage system, an A shape uh, position as well. So those are the naming conventions that we could use. So then within the shape, I'm going to break out of uh, the shape into the number of strings, into chunking the strings for better memorization. I've seen two main categories of chunking of the strings. I'm imagining a five string instrument on the guitar plus an added E string. So you could chunk the strings into a two string, two string, one string shape. I call the that the seven note uh, house analogy shape or a three string, uh, two string shape, which I call the five note <coughs> hamburger or barbell pentatonic shape that mo most people use. In terms of the seven note hamburger shape, uh, if I if I look at this hamper, you've got the, 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 the house here and then the double stop. And then down here, you've got the double stop and, and uh, the house. And then you've got the two note per string. I'm sorry, the double stop house is here. And it's shifted up because of the kink in the tuning. And then you've got the two note per string, what I would call flat or in the pentatonic, that's the meat of the hamburger. So if I looked at that analogy, if I that's useful because this box stands out. That's where the half steps are. And it's useful also to note when you break out the fretboard this way, this box will always be in the five shapes. So that means that the half steps are the determining factors within the different modes. You just wanna know, and you can look for that box and just say, where are the half steps relative to the note I'm starting at? And that will give you an idea of you know what modes you're playing in. Uh, so when we, when I look at when we when we compare this shortly to the three note per string shape, that's not always the case. So that's kind of interesting to note here when you're breaking out the guitar in that way. That box will always be there. And if I want to convert from a seven note back to a five note, I can remove the upper left and the bottom right. Notice I'm always in the key of C. We're practicing in the key of C. Maybe later we're going to move to the key of G. We're, we're looking at the key of C and related modes because those don't have any sharps and flats. But the idea is we're learning it in such a way that I'm not, I'm not emphasizing the notes in the key of C. We're looking at the relative positions. So this relative box will be there even if we switch up to the key of G and related modes, right? And then I can remove the one behind it. That's the Locrian part of the shape. And then I can remove the one up bottom right which is the Lydian part of the shape. And that would convert it from my seven note house analogy to a five note pentatonic. I can also look at it from a five note pentatonic type shape, uh, in which case I would have what I would call the barbell here, and then the hamburger here, which might be easier to see over here because it's not split between the, uh, the, the top and the bottom. So in that analogy, then we have uh, the barbell. That's the outer side of the barbell. We have the major, the main minors and the main majors. And the middle of the barbell is what we would not be playing in a five note pentatonic and would be adding if we wanted to play the seven note, uh, the seven note. And notice what's being added here, the bottom right of the, the square. And that's gonna be the Lydian. And then we have down here, the top left of the square, which is shifted up because of the fault line, which is the Locrian. And then in the hamburger shape, which might be easier to see over here because we don't have the, it's not split between the two shapes. Then you can see that, that this would be the hamburger shape. We would have to add to it. Then the one to the right of it, which would be like putting the hat, a ball cap on the hamburger. And that's going to be the uh, Lydian. And you can see it because that's the box. So once again, we're at the box here and that, that's the one that would be removed. And then on the bottom left is the Locrian, which once again is the top right if you see it in terms of the box. So those are just the, those are the ways we're gonna keep on reiterating. I wanna be able to shift my mind as much as possible to seeing it kind of like, kind of like looking at those pictures where you can see it like if you look at it one way, it looks like an, an old lady or a witch or something. If you look at it another way, it looks like a face or something like that, right? 
I, I don't know if, if that's the right picture, but that's how I'd like to see the fretboard so I can switch back and forth and say, okay, I'm seeing it. I want to do that spunt as any time I want. I want to tell my mind, hey, look, I'm now I'm going to the house analogy and now I'm going to the five note pentatonic and I want to be able to play in, in either of those. The more I can do that, I feel like that is knowing the fretboard. Like there, that that's kind of what knowing the fret, the more of those connections I can make, the more I kind of like know the fretboard, it seems to me. All right, so so as we go through this, I'm gonna try to add some of our other, I wanna emphasize in my mind the idea that when I go through these shapes, we we get the mode and then what's the utility of getting those modes? We'll, we'll start to build chords. And what you might say, well, I, I, all I have to do is build a major chord and a minor chord, I know what that is. But maybe we'll start to look more at then adding the six, uh, uh, the seven, the nine, the eleven, and the thirteen. Five. Well, not the six. Let's say the six. Hide. Hide that, because <laughs> this way we usually say it's a one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. That's what we usually call uh, the intervals when we build the chords which are, is just gonna build a scale. So if I'm in the Dorian, in other words, notice if I then build a chord off of the third here, off of the F, then this is the third related to the F, the fifth related to the F, uh, this is a seventh related to the F, and notice these are all the keys, all the notes that are still in the key of C major or D Dorian or F Lydian. So this is basically simply mapping out the the F, uh, the, the Lydian mode, but it's doing it by saying, skipping every other note, the one, the three, the five, the seven. So, so maybe when we start to build our chords, we can start to look a little bit more about the relationships, not be just between the one, three, five, but then add the seven, the nine, and the 11. As we do that remembering, that the 7, 9, 11, or the 9, 11, 13, all that is are the even notes that we skipped. So we skipped the two, that's the nine, right? We skipped the three, we skipped the four, that's the 11, we skipped the five, that's the 13. On a piano, you would imagine it would be an, an octave up when you play the 9, 11, and 13. But on the guitar, we're just gonna grab whatever note we we <laughs> we could find because we don't have as many options so we're just i don't care if you call it if you call the nine a two it's equivalent to a two as far as i can see right and on the guitar if i could find i'm not going to look for the octave the proper octave usually i'm just going to be like like if i want to add a nine i'm going to look for the two in the chord and just grab whatever i can get because again we don't have as many options here all right so that's the plan but <clears throat> let's go back to the three note just to get an idea of the difference. Remember the rule here is that we're, we're going to say that we never span more than five frets from any point that I start from. And I only want to have my entire shape fit in within four to five frets. So those are the rules of this shape. Now if I change the rules a little bit and we go to the three note per string shape, this time we're looking at the Dorian here. Uh, then we're going to start on the Dorian and just look at the pros and cons of the three note per string shape. So if I started, if I, <clears throat> if I started the Dorian up here, we have uh, the Dorian up top and let's just look at this from our, our three kind of perspectives up top. Let's look at it by shape and then get an idea of how the rules are changing. Now, remember that I, one thing to note, if I took it from the key of C from like here and I wanted to, to, to learn our shapes, now the shape on a, on a three note per string is really uh, a, has this, what I call the three pillar shape. It has the three pillar shape and then it has the uh, house double stop or the box double stop and the double stop box which breaks out into two, four, five, six, seven strings. And there's only five strings on the guitar plus a repeated E. So that means that we're gonna have to go through more than one set on the guitar to have the shape repeat. Now that doesn't mean that I've gotta go through more than one set on the guitar to play through an octave. 
one of the beautiful things about this system is that there's three notes on a string, which means you're playing three, six out of the seven notes in the main, in all of our scales in two strings only. That means you've, all, you've almost got through an entire octave just in two strings, right? So, so this, this gets you through one octave, two octaves, and then like halfway through the next octave in one set of strings. But the shape goes through seven strings. So if I was to repeat the shape, notice what we have here. I have the middle of what I would call this three pillar shape. That's where we start on the major scale, the middle of that shape. And then we go to the box double stop and notice the, this box is being split up here. The box was split. So now I'm including the entire box if I continue. And then we go to the double stop box. And then here's our E, which repeats up top. So I could keep going up here, or I'll just keep going down here. We're calling it the Dorian now, but you could just say it's a continuation of the key of C. Here's the bottom. Here's the top of the three pillars. And then we're back to the middle of the three pillars. So here's the repeated shape. Here, I had to go all the way around from here. Here's the top of the shape we started with. Here's the when we finally get back to that other shape. So that's just looking at it in terms of the shapes. When I look at the Dorian, all I'm doing is saying, okay, I'm just gonna start from here. I'm not gonna imagine I'm continuing on from the C. I'm just gonna start at my D and then, and then say that I'm in the Dorian which means in this particular shape, we're never gonna go behind. I never have to go backwards with the three notes per string. It's always leaning forwards because we're always doing three notes per string and the intervals between the string means we're always gonna be either below it or leaning forward. So then we have, uh, th this is the bottom of the double stop box shape and then we're at the top of the three pillars. Now this is interesting to note here because, because these three pillars are, are give you this added reach which you never would have you wouldn't have if you're in this shape this shape right here is the dorian shape uh, or you might call it position number three shape or possibly a d shape from the caged system and and oftentimes we you know we play it like this we, we put <laughs> We don't usually, and we don't usually think about the idea that I could, on these three strings, just reach outside of that shape, because it's it's totally reachable, right? So I can I can add that. So if I can add that without messing up my concept that I'm still in shape number three in my mind, then that gives me a, a lot more flexibility to kind of reach up there, especially when you're in this higher the higher register. And it also allows you, if you don't want to reach up there like that, to give you like two hamburgers, like. So I can see that shape, I can give double stops. It's just an easy shape to visualize. And I can visualize that shape along with what I already know in position number three, and just kind of add that in fairly easy as a, as a way to kind of add in some components of this three note per string shape. Like the first thing I learned on the three note per string is was actually in, I was starting to look at this, the key of C, that's what I would in be in called position number two. And I wanna do that bluesy thing where you kind of reach up like this. And it's like, well, how, do, what, how does that even fit? Right, I have to think about, well, that means shape number two is fitting in shape number three and these fit in there, but it's a lot easier to say, well, no, I can just say, I can just switch my mind and say, well, if I think about this from the three note per string perspective, then of course that fits, right? And then go back to my normal position number two. So I can start to integrate, I can start to integrate in my mind the two ways to visualize that. I haven't done that so much with the Dorian, but I think it's quite useful here because you know that so that's I think a useful <clears throat> thing just to take away from that. 
But let's count it up <clears throat> uh, in terms of, of intervals. So what do we have here? <clears throat> we've got on the Dorian, uh, we've got a two note away major second. We've got a uh, three note away major third. Three note away major third. We've got a five note away perfect fourth. Five note away perfect fourth. This is the same under both shapes. And then we've got a seven note away perfect fifth. Notice the shape has not changed under the two shapes, but now it's gonna change. So now we're gonna go to the seven, uh, the sixth. It's a, it's a nine note away major six instead of a minor. So that in the three note per string, we would reach out here. Whereas if I was staying in shape number, uh, shape number three, it would be back here. And so that means that I'm not gonna, if I was doing a three note per string, I wouldn't grab that. I would grab this one and that would be my 10 note away seven. And then that will get me back to my octave. So that's interesting. Now, <clears throat> that's interesting. And so, so this same shape, by the way, I could think of it like I'm starting right here. Well, this would be, cause what I'm doing right now and what we're playing over here is using this, what I would call shape number five. But we're starting at the door end. So, so let's, I'm not gonna think about that right now. We could, so let's do that. Uh, and so then, so that is interesting to note. If I, if I said this door, this D right there, well, let's just keep it at that. The other thing I just wanna touch on here is that if I'm looking at what I would call shape number five, uh, if I played from the top string here from the three note per string that would, and played in the key of the mixolydian. So this is the mixolydian shape. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's gonna be the shape and the orange from our five, uh, sh five notes. If I played the G, I, I think this is an interesting shape because, because now this is the top from a three note per string shape, this is the top of the three pillar. So, rem so remember when I was looking at like this key of C, which is the main major, I was thinking this is the second position, but then I could reach out here. Uh, and I just wanna note that when I'm in position five, if I was in the, the, the key of uh, mixolydian, I could also do it while I'm in the key of D, right? I could say, well, if I'm, if I'm in the key of Dorian, this D down here, I can reach up here. So what, no matter what mode I'm in, if I'm in position number five, it's kind of interesting to note that, that from the three note per string, you have the three pillars right on top, which is kind of easy to visualize. So if I'm in shape number five going, in the mixolydian shape, I could also just, and I'm also kind of struggling with if I'm gonna reach five strings out. I see some people still fingering it with their ring finger and then reaching out here. But I see other people reaching this way with their pointer, which allows you to reach a little further, especially if you're doing this shuffle pattern. So that's a little easier for me than doing this. And beyond that, sometimes you reach out to that seven, which would be, I'd have to do it this way. No, that's way stretchy for me. So I, I've been thinking about if I'm going five strings out, pointing with my ring, and then if I'm only going four out, do that. The 
because maybe that'll tell my hand, hey look, you're going five strings out versus four strings to reach for that pinky. But that stretchy stuff also helps, I think, that's also where I'm experimenting with my guitar in more of a classical position because I think that puts my thumb behind the neck a little bit more and possibly allows me to reach higher even though I don't have giant monster hands. But again, I watch these little girls, these not little, but beautiful young petite women uh, playing with hands that can't be any bigger than mine uh, and reaching all over the place with and like classical stuff. So, I mean, I can't really, I can't really, I think my hands are f fine. So, uh, anyways, can't blame the hands. So, if I was in this shape. <laughs> Whenever I look at this, whenever I look at this Mixolydian thing, I start thinking about this whole bluesy thing happening, where, <laughs> where it's like, okay, I could think of it as a, a okay, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to get into that right now. But let's, so then I could do the same thing on the lean back shapes. So if I looked at these lean back shapes, now this is a two note per string shape. And if I looked at it from the Dorian position, I would normally think of the Dorian position as up here, right? So up here. And then it's cool on these two note per string shapes that it's always going to be a lean back. So we're never going to lean forward on these shapes. It's always going to be a lean back uh, situation. And these shapes actually generate automatically the, pent the, 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 the chord so that you can arpeggiate it if you wanted to think about it that way because we pick every other note in order to build the chord. And if there's only two notes per string that we're building this on, it's one, two, and we skip the two to the three, we skip the four to the five, we skip the six to the seven, we skip the, se to the eight to the nine. So this actually is almost the most natural kind of, of way to see the, uh, the actual arpeggios on the guitar is this lean back diagonal all the way down the shape. So if I looked at it from the key of D, then I can actually see it as I'm just going to build a lean back shape, which I would call a, uh, a, a, a G type shape from the cage system, you might call it. A one, this is the minor third, and a five. And then I can go to the next one up, which would be Phrygian on the E. And if I build a chord from that, it would also be a minor chord, which would be boom, boom, boom. One, three, five. And if I connect those two together, I get my, I get my scale. One, two, three, four. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'd have to go seven, eight, and 
but then I like to stop here and then go do my chord then on the key of D. So one, two, three, four, five, six. back six five four three two one one two three four five six da, 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 da. six six five four three two one one two three four five six da, 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 da. six five four three two one you know i think that's kind of an interesting little exercise but i could do the same thing from any d Right, I can go from this D, because what I'm playing here is I'm in this position, position five, and I'm going from this D. So if I went from that D, it would be going from the D shape to to the the B shape. So it, it would actually be, let's do it this one. It would be like this one. So, and then I make the, this one should be red on the D. And then copy, and then it would be paste. Now, wait a sec. Well, I don't need to go up there. I'll go down here, and then here, and then copy, and paste, and paste. So I can do that same concept down here and say well now I'm looking at this D well now I just build a lean back shape from that which might be what you call like a C minor shape from a caged system because I'm on the second note down and then if I move up to the E then here's the E I'd make a lean back shape from here and then I could just connect those two together so any note I could do this on any any time I find the D and say okay well now I can see it from a two note per string perspective saying that I'm I'm looking at now wait a second well the D's on this side so I'm actually saying the D's on the second so I'm actually if I want to stay in position I'm going on this side so in this case I would be playing a major so now I'm looking at the key of C so here's my C to here, here, normal C shape, and then my D shape. So I'm in the key of C, but that's what's in position five. That's why I'm doing this. If this makes any sense. <laughs> so then I'm gonna go. And then I'm gonna go. But this is gonna be oh, snorted. Dang it! Cut that out. Cut that out, Phil. I don't need snorting in my video. This is gonna be one, two, three, four, five. So, wait a sec. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be this open G. So in position. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, five, four, three, two, four, one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, five, four, three, two, one. And then uh, there's my lean back shape. gonna stop that I'm I'm just babbling now <clears throat> let's go back to the key of C and do our normal process going from the bottom to the top but I'm gonna try to build chords as we go so we're gonna go from this one up but before we do that let's do a joke this is a short one no politics in this one I don't think so it shouldn't offend anybody too much <clears throat> You know, I have a strange kind of Icarus problem when I travel. An Icarus problem when I travel. You know, from flying too close to the sun, because Icarus, like, glued wings on his heels that, with wax that burnt when he got too close to the sun, I think. Or, and, then he, and, then he, and then, of course, he fell. But, but really, for me, it's not because I'm afraid 
that the plane's going to melt from the sun so much. It's because I'm always seated next to, next to this crying little child. And it's like, honestly, never fly too close to the sun. Never, 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 fly, never fly too close to the sun. Causes nothing but problems. Especially if the sun is only one. I'll tell you that. You just get, it's just a loud crying mess. And you have to deal with it. And everybody's got it. So just word of advice, Icarus problem for flying. I'm just kidding. I don't even have a son. I'd fly with him, even if he was crying, if I had a son. But whatever. I'm not even sure Icarus is the right Greek god. Um, maybe I got that wrong. I don't know. But anyways, it's just a joke. Don't get, don't, don't get too technical on it. We're going to go. Let's make this. Uh, we're going to now say, I want to, wait a second. Why did I do that? Uh, yeah. So the lidding and the locry and all the remote. Okay. So we're going to go back now. So we're in position, what I would call position number five. You might call it a, uh, mixolydian shape. And, uh, but we're going to be playing, f uh, the Dorian in it, meaning we're starting from here. So first off, how would I know, uh, where to start from? Uh, a couple different ways we might say well if i know if i see this shape as a mixolydian shape the mixolydian is the fifth of the relative major which is our rosetta stone and so i could just count up till i get back to the first and then get to the to the second which is the dorian so in other words if this is the fifth i could count up my shape and say five six seven eight or one so there's my c or one and then I want to get to the second related to the C, so I can go boom, boom, and that would be one up from there. So there's my D. Or I can say, okay, well, uh, maybe I know it by position. So again, maybe I don't know where the D position is, but I know where the C is relative to this box, and that's my Rosetta Stone. So I might just say, okay, look at the shape. Uh, da, where's the box? There's the box. And the, and, the, and the penthouse of the box is on the top right. There's my C. And the C, if the C is the first, the Dorian is the second relative to the first. So there's the second. Or I can say, well, where does the D live in terms of my shapes? And if, by the way, where's the C in terms of the hamburger? If I play this shape, I'm like, well, what if I only know, like, what if I know the pentatonic shape? Well, then we've, we've got... So there's the, there's the meat of the hamburger right there uh, is the C, so you might see it like that way. So there's the meat of the hamburger. And then, and then you could say, well, in terms of where does the D lie in terms of the house analogy? Well, it's not in the house because it's, an, it's a minor mode, therefore it's hanging in the double stop. So it's on the double stop side of the double stop box, and it's on the... Uh, it's on the double. It's on the top of the double stop. When we go to the uh, to the, I'm sorry. It's on the bottom of the double stop. When we go to the uh, double stop box shape down here. Da -da. So that's it. We might find it by shape that way. Okay. So we're going to start down here at the bottom of the shape. Now, if I was to, to, to just count it backwards, if we start down here, we're going to go, okay, here's my shape. This is going to be 8, 7, 6, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, So most of us, including me, probably don't like look at that as the Dorian. Although I play in Dorian, but I often don't like see it like starting from the, that position. So it might just just walking through the scale is kind of good to do. I think eight seven six five four three two one. I usually see it. Like that perspective of playing like this open note and then reaching up Dorian versus the minor has this in it. 
but yeah, anyway. Okay. And then from the hamburger analogy, the Dorian actually encompasses the entire hamburger. Meaning if I see the hamburger over here, it's the top left bun uh, to the bottom right bun of the hamburger. That's where the Dorian lives. All right, let's just walk it back then and say we're going to go to the seventh. So if we're going to, we're going to compare everything to uh, this D and walk it backwards. If I go uh, down from that, uh, from that D to the C, what is that? Well, if it's the seventh of the door in, it's got to be a 10 note away minor seventh because I just know that. Uh, if I was to count that, how would I count that? Because I can count from the C, which is the way we would normally go, which would be five this way. And notice this is going to be an issue for us. These shapes are important because this one has crossed the fault line. So this whole bit has been shifted up and therefore all of our shapes are going to be slightly different because of the fault line. And so it's good practice for us here. So we're going to say, all right, if I count it here, it'd be five, four, three, two. So that would be a two note away uh, uh, major second from C to D. And then, and then if I go the other way, it would be 12 minus two, 10 note away, minor seven. So that's how I can tell that. Now, I also know that the seventh of mode number two, Dorian, Dorian is the second mode. So here's my Rosetta Stone, the, the major scale, the two, the Dorian is the second. Therefore, I have to count up one to get to the Dorian. It's one step up from the Ionian. So if I wanted to go back to the Ionian, I would say it's two minus one is one, plus the relative position of the Dorian, the second, gives me three, absolute mode number three. And if I know it's the third of, see this is the third, right, of right there, of the related major, then I can say, uh, uh, wait a sec, I'm not, on, I'm not on the two, I'm on the, <laughs> two minus one is one, plus seven is eight, minus seven modes gives me one, which would be the Ionian. So we'd be on, you know, the Ionian. So that would be uh, the major. So this would be the Ionian right there. Where does the Ionian live? It's of course in the box, which is hard to see because it's been shifted up due to the fault line. You can see it up here. It's at the top right of the box in the box analogy. When you look at the barbell analogy, five note pentatonic barbell, it's on the right side of the barbell, on the weights of the barbell. Okay. And uh, let's say we were to build some chords from that. So, so obviously, if it's the first of the relative major, I know I'm going to make a major chord from it because the one, four, five are major chord constructions. I also see that with a capital letter over here. But I also know that all of the intervals related to the major scale will work. So notice what that means here. I have the I have the C I have the the C G the the C E and G are going to give me my my triad. But then, of course, I can add uh, the seventh is a B, the ninth is a D, which is also the second, and the eleventh is an F, and the thirteenth uh, is our A. So if I have my C down here, notice what what are my options to build a chord from there? I have I have what I would normally looking down because normally we think of going down, but I also have the ability to look up. And I can use this C as like the middle of my chord too. So it's kind of a mess. There's kind of a lot of options here, right? So I could look up this way and say, well, I know I, if I look up, I, I have my fifth, which isn't there, but up here because of the kink in the tuning. So there's my G, my fifth. So if I wanted to just play a power chord, I can go from, from there to there. Now it's hard to grab like an E within that position, right? I could say, okay, where's an E? There's one right below it, but I can't grab that at the same time. I could arpeggiate it, right? So I could be doing something like this. And get basically all of the tones, right? But not at not at one time. And then I and then I could say, well, I have an E, like the next E is like up here, right? That would be like kind of a stretch or back here. So I've got that E. So I could like try to reach back to that E which would be my third. So now I have to know that that's an inverted, the inverse of my third, and then I'd have to reach up there. That's gonna be uh, 
I don't think I can do that. Certainly not. Certainly not uh, a normally played position. So I'm probably just going to stick with my power chord uh, from there and then add the E underneath it from that position. What if I look the other way and I say, okay, well, I could go like looking uh, up. I could say right above it, I should have my fifth because if I go down, it would be the fourth. Therefore, if I go this way, the one right above it would be a perfect fifth. There's my, there's my G. And then if I look up to uh, the, the third, notice the third is right below it as well. So there's my A shape. And then of course, uh, so, so I have, does that make sense? So I have the, the C, the E, and the G, right? And then of course, and then there's my A shape right there. So then I have also, if I look at this C and this, uh, and this G, then I can, I can look up to my E there. So I could also play it like this way, reaching out this way. So that's an inverted. So now I've got to say, does that make sense? Well, that, I mean, because now this, I'm saying this is now a, a third. Is that a third? How, how can I check that? Well, I could say a third should be a three. It's a, it's a, I'm building a major chord because it's the Ionian mode. Should be a four note away major third. How do I know that? Well, it'd be five, 10, nine, eight, inverse 12 minus eight is four. So yeah, four note away. So, right. So that's why learning these inverses is useful. If I can do that pretty quickly, if I could say, if I could say, oh, that's eight note away, that would be a, and then it would be a third if I'm measuring from here, <laughs> right? Which I can't do it like I'm, I can't do that like automatically, but that's what I'm kind of trying to get better at. Okay. And then if I went uh, back here, we've got like the third back here, but then I've got uh, the fifth up top, I could reach down to that fifth. That's going to be quite, that's the reach that we were looking at uh, basically uh, before. If I go to my lean back thing, to the lean back, now I've got my, uh, this one is right underneath it because of the kink in the tuning. Usually the third is like here, but it's right underneath it. And the fifth then is uh, right here, which is usually again, usually back one, be but because of the kink in the tuning. So that's a playable shape. So I've got That's useful <laughs> right, on those top three strings. That's my lean back shape, which looks a little different because of the kink in the tuning, right? That would be just like my lean back shape up here if I was in the key, if I was on this C, uh, but I would lean back to the third would be right underneath it, right? It would be right there, boom, and then the fifth, which I don't normally, right, it would be back there. So that's the C. Okay, let's, let's move on. Let's go back to the next one down, which is going to be the sixth. So if I was on the C, now we're going down. What am I working with? I'm trying to compare everything to what, to this D. Uh, wait a second, hold on, I'm on this D. And now I'm on the B. Okay, so that's a nine note away, major six. How do I know that? Because if I count up from the B, it would be five, four, three. So from B to D, it would be a three note away minor third, even though it looks like a major third because of the fault line. And therefore the inverse 12 minus three would be a nine note away minor six going from bottom to top. Nine note away minor six. Okay. I also know that the sixth of mode number two, Dorian, is two minus one is one plus six gives me seventh relative position to the major scale, which I know is the weird uh, is the weird one, the one with a diminished seventh, and that would be the Locrian mode. 
So I'm not gonna build too much on the Locrian mode because we don't do that too often. Just to note though, that the, the, we have that distinctive uh, fifth, which is gonna be a, a flat fifth. So usually the fifth is a seven note away perfect fifth. Now we have a six note away uh, flat fifth. How do I know that? Because this would be five here and then six. So there's the distinctive interval. So let's go back then to the fifth. Oh, by the way, where does the Locrian live? It's in the Locrian in the house analogy is in the is in the back of the house. The house is shifted up. It's in the basement. And if I wanted to go from a seven note house analogy to a five note pentatonic, it would be removed to play the pentatonic. And in the barbell analogy, it's within the barbell here, but it wouldn't be played. It would have to be added from the five note pentatonic to get to the seven note. All right, to the fifth, to the fifth, which is gonna be the A. So now we're comparing this D. So this D to this, A. what is it, this D, I keep on wanting to go over there. What is that? That's a seven note away perfect fifth. How do I know that? Because if I went from the A down, it would be a five note away because of the kink in the tuning. So A to D, five note away, uh, five note away, perfect fourth, therefore 12 minus five, invert, because the perfects are inverse of each other, seven note away, perfect fifth. Okay, and, we're, and I also know that the fifth of mode two A uh, Dorian is two minus one is one, plus five is six. So it would be the sixth of the related major, which I know would be a minor chord construction, having a minor third, because the two, three, six of the minor, of the major scale are the minor chord constructions. Beyond that, I know it's the main minor of Aeolian. So all of these notes would build basically an Aeolian scale, uh, a minor scale, right? So, that, so if I wanted to build a chord, I, would, I could start with a, with a minor third, so if I'm down here, again, it's some, usually hard for most people when you're down here to like start to build the chord because you usually build bar chords from the top two strings or maybe the third. So I could say, well, I know my fifth is always right there, but now it's an added string out. So I know that is there, but then it's gonna be, so that's the, the five and then, and then how do I know that? Because it'd be, it's a seven that away perfect fifth. So it would be, it'd be five, six, seven. And then I need to find a third, which is gonna be in our case, that C. So where's the third gonna be? Well, we have this third, but I can't really play it at the same time, but I could do something like. Kind of arpeggiate it. We also have uh, a third back here which is not as easy to reach. Again, I can't really play it at the same time, but you know, I have. I can't really reach it with my pinky at the same time. So we could arpeggiate it like that, right? So in any case, we have that's what most people probably would think of like first. If I look at it this way, I'm like, okay, well, where, where's my minor third from here? You would think it would be like back further, but no, it looks like a major third, but it's a minor third right there. So if I look at that, there's, there's my minor third, and then I'm gonna find my looking up, my fifth is right above it. So that's our normal finger structure it's kind of inverted until you put the E on top, of, I mean the, the added open A on top of it, which would be our bar chord. But I don't need to bar it because we're in open position. So we have that. I can also say, well, instead of grabbing this C, what if I leaned forward? So I have my one, I have my five, and then my third is up there, right? I could, I could do that. 
Most people don't do that, but you could. And it gives you an inverted sound, heavier kind of sound. How do I know that that is my third? Because it should be a three note away minor third. If I count this way, it'd be five, uh, 10, nine. So nine, 12 minus nine is three. So yeah, so, so if I count everything from the A, it's like there's the A, there's the fifth right above it. And the, uh, the, the fifth is right above it because if I count from this down, uh, it would be a it would be a five note away perfect fourth if I go from the bottom up seven note away perfect fifth right so I could see that right and then uh, and so that's a couple ways we can do that one all right moving on moving on spending too much time uh, going over stuff get to the point get to the point oh I'll get to the point and it's going to be a pointy point. I'm going to... So then I'm going to go to this G. All right. Ah, my arm is starting to hurt here. So the G is uh, the fourth, which is going to be, if it's a fourth related to the Dorian, it's got to be a five note away perfect fourth. How do I know that? Well, if I count from this way down, it'd be five and then 10 up here because of the fault line nine, eight, seven. So going this way would be a seven note away wait, from here to here. Seven note away, perfect fifth, which I would think would be back one, but no, because the fault line is still between these two notes. It's between these two and this one is crossing it. And so, so, and then the inverse of, of uh, that was a, that was like five, that was five, 10, nine, eight, seven, inverse 12 minus seven is a five note away perfect fourth. So going this way, five note away perfect fourth. Okay. And then we also know that the fourth of a Dorian is mode number two minus one is one plus four gives me five. The relative fifth position of the major scale, I know I would build a major chord from it, but beyond that, I know it's the mixolydian mode, which has a distinctive interval of a uh, flat seven, even though it's a major chord. So that's where you get that flat seven one, which would be an F in this case. So if I was to build that, I can say now I'm kind of starting to be in familiar territory. So most people would lean forward if I was to build the chord and say, well, there's my fifth. And then where's my third? It's going to be down here. This is like that, that D shape. If you can maneuver your fingers to pick that one up, you can see that little D shape. But most people just kind of mute it and do that. But uh, then I can also say, well, I want to get my seven in there. And usually the seventh, the minor seven would be like, would be like right here. But now it's got to be uh, up one to here. So I can put this finger down. And I get that minor seven in there. So that's useful. I can only do that, by the way, on the fifth. Because if I did, if I move that whole thing up to the C up top, notice I have the same shape here. If I move that up, if I move this up to like the A, well, the A is a minor. Let's go all the way up to the C. See, see now I have I have boom, 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 but then I don't have, I can't put this finger down in the same position because it, because that interval, even though I'm making another major chord, doesn't have the same seven. So see what I mean when I get past a major or minor chord, the seven, the nine and 11, I can't really tell just by, just by, uh, all, all three of them won't be the same because they don't always have, even though they have the same third major or minor, they don't have the same seven, nine and 11. Okay. So then I can say, well, what if I wanted to add, you know, like the nine is, is an A. So the nine related to the mixolydian would be a normal A distance for a major key, which would be a nine note away. I mean, uh, the ninth, would be <laughs> see this gets messy too because the ninth is equivalent to the two 
and it would be equivalent to the distance of the two, which would be a two node away uh, major second. So, so if I look at my, if I want to play the ninth, I'm looking for a second. So if this was, if this was my G, I'm, there's my A right there. I have an A above it. So I could do something like this, the, the two above it. I'm muting the one underneath it. And then I'm picking up the fifth. I don't have a third in that construction. I could, uh, I could pick up the D, which would be uh, the fifth above it. So I could pick up these three. And I'm kind of view, if I pick up these three, I might be able to call it something else, right? But I'm looking at it from the perspective of a G and saying I'm adding like the second, which is the ninth, right? And, and so I could see it that way. And then I could maybe add the third like that, which would be behind it, like these three. So something like this. So now I've got, now I've got basically these three and I added the nine above it, right? If I wanted to add like the 11, which is equivalent to the fourth, the fourth is going to be a, uh, a, the normal fourth is a five note away perfect fourth. So normally I see that like right below it. So I'd be like, well, there's my G right below it would be like a fourth, right? If I had a fourth right there and then above it, so if I play these three, you, could, you might view that as something other than like a G chord, but if I'm looking at it from the perspective of a G, then I'm saying now I've, I've got a G with a fifth, uh, a fifth above it and a fourth below it. And then I'm, I would like to get a third in there. Uh, and the third is a B, so I could maybe grab the B down here. So a B on the seven. I'm trying to mute the string in between. But I don't really need to because that's an F or that's an E. So the E would still be, that would be adding an 11. All right, that's cool. <laughs> or I could add the B on top, maybe up here, and say, Say I add it like that, bar chord, and then add that top bit. That's kind of interesting. I could bar this whole thing off and add that one. So in any case, and then if I wanted to add like the 13, the 13 is equivalent to the 6. And I know the 6 for a major scale is a 9 note away major 6. So normally that would be like back here but now it's up here it looks like a 10 note away seven but it's actually the six so so that's the that's the e that i was already adding anyway all right so that's i'm going to try to do play with that more so we can actually put these intervals into practice but i'm wearing down so let's just finish this off before i before i break down and cry i don't know why i would cry i'll just break down and pass out or something so now we're going to go back to the uh f uh uh where 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 are we here we are so that's going to be the f is a uh three note away minor third if it's the third how do i know that because i could say from the f it would be five ten nine so this shape would be a nine note away, a nine note away uh, uh, major six, the inverse 12 minus nine, three note away, three note away uh, minor third, okay? And I know that the two minus one is one plus three is four, uh, and the fourth of the major scale would be a major chord because the, the, the one, four, five would be the majors. And beyond that, I know the fourth is the Lydian, the Lydian having a distinctive fourth interval, which is an augmented fourth. So a six note away 
augmented fourth, which is the same as a diminished fifth in terms of distance. So that's that weird one. So if I was to take that F, I can say, okay, where does the F live? In the house analogy, it's in the bottom of the house uh, because it's a major key. And it's the one that would be removed if we go from a seven note, uh, a seven note scale back to a five note pentatonic. In terms of the barbell analogy, it's in the barbell, but it's in the handle part, which would be removed uh, if we went if we weren't playing if we were only playing the five notes. If we build a chord off of it, most people would lean forward and say, "Okay, we've got that same D shape because we're we're playing it from the same string." Uh, and, and leaning forward. So there's our D shape. But now if I want to add like the seven, the seven is no longer in the same place because it's going to be a normal major seven. So the seven is going to be uh, the E now. So that's going to be this one. So I could then bar that. seven the D is actually the 11 so if I wanted to pick up the 11 from this shape I can I can instead of trying to mute the middle note with this finger I can play it add in the 11 that's useful to know all right and then if I if I wanted to do the lean back shape then I can say there's my lean back shape so that gives me my F, there's my third. That's the F shape, which is my normal shape, which I could play like that or like that, which means I can add on top of that F shape this way, the fifth, that's what that is doing. And then I can add another F, which is the bar chord. And then if I lean it forward, I know the fifth is above it. And I know the third is that distance right there, I believe, right? That's the third. So if I went this way, I can go, am I sure that's the third? It should be a major third. How can I count that? Because it would be five, 10, nine, eight, 12 minus eight is four. So that looks like the major third. So it's inverted, but it's still an F if you think about it that way. Okay, let's move on. Moving on uh, to the second enough of that i have had enough no moss we're gonna go here to the second uh here back to the e Whoa, is that right all right so that's gonna be it should be a two note away uh a two i'm looking at this d a two note away major second. How do I know that? Because this would be five, this would be 10. So going from top to bottom would be a 10 note away uh, minor seven. Therefore, 12 minus 10 is two. Two note away major second going the other way. I know that the second of mode number two, Dorian is two minus one is one plus two is three. The third of the relative major would be a minor chord construction because the uh, two, three, and six are minor chord constructions, plus the Phrygian uh, would have the distinctive interval of a minor second. So if I built a chord, so where does it live, the Phrygian? It's in the house analogy, seven note house analogy in the back of the house by the basement. And in terms of, and it's in terms of the barbell hamburger pentatonic, it would be in the pentatonic in the left hand side of the barbell. And if I built a chord from it, most people again would think of the lean forward chord, which means I would say, okay, there's my fifth. And then where now I'm on a minor chord construction. So where's the third? The third is gonna be then uh, the A here. So I've got to pick up uh, the A, which is a little wonky. So I can do that. And then Okay, what if I what if I 
Now, a lot of people might see that shape. Uh, we can do that shape. Okay, that's not right. What am I thinking? The A is the A of this one. I'm looking at that I'm at the wrong thing. I was like, wait a second. All right, I'm getting, so it's down here. That makes sense. Okay, I was like, that's not what I've been doing though, is it? So, so we're gonna, so it's that third, okay. And, how, and so, okay, that makes sense. And then notice if I wanted to add the seventh here, I'd have to pick up my finger off the third, but I could do that and pick it up and put it on that D. So there means picking up the D versus the G. So that's kind of interesting. And then I have, uh, if I look at the, the E here, we can say under the E, or like above the E, we're gonna have then the fifth. So if that's the fifth, then we've got then the third up here. So we could play it this way. So when I'm playing my, my normal E minor like this, I could add that G, which you might think is a G chord, but really, if I'm still holding down that E, it's kind of like e, if I let go of that E, you know, I might get more of the G, G feel, which is this. But this would be the G, how do I know that's a third, minor third, five, 10, nine, and then 12 minus nine would be three. So then we have the, the E, the G, and the B. All right, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I think I've made some errors here, but it's a practice session. So so we're putting the we're putting the uh, the intervals into shape into work here as we build chords as we go through the shape. So maybe I'm gonna keep practicing that tomorrow.